Thank you very much, Tony and Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It's, uh, it really is a great pleasure for me to be back here in Dublin uh, to see some familiar faces and some new ones as well. For the new ones, um, those who don't know me, I, um, I'm from Dublin myself, um, which makes it very nice to be able to have an opportunity to come back and speak in my home city. In fact, I went to school about 100 yards from here at Belvedere College um, for 10 years, so I arrived a little early this morning. I had a very nostalgic wander around in the sunshine and looking in the gates of my, my old school, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be back here to, uh, to address this forum, and I, uh, I know from past experience it's always an extremely lively and useful uh, discussion for me. Uh, now, my title... Uh, I was actually uh, sitting down having a cup of coffee this morning. I realized there's an error <coughs> in the title. I wonder if you can all spot it. It may be a sort of Freudian one. Because the title is, Can the Balkans Recover from the Economic Crisis? And anyone spot the error? <laughs> uh, there's no question mark. Now, <laughs> that's not deliberate. <laughs> it was a genuine omission. But I wonder if, uh, sort of subconsciously, I, I, there was a reason why it was left out. Because I... Uh, uh, among people who follow this region and that I talk to regularly, I think I'm known as being on the sort of optimistic, if you look at the spectrum of optimism to pessimism, I'm more on the optimistic side. I do believe that uh, the Balkans has come a long way, as indeed Chris Tveach and I argued in, in this book. Um, particularly in the last 10 years, there's been a dramatic transformation of this region. And although it's going through a very difficult period now, <coughs> I do believe that uh, it will recover from this crisis. And it's still, I think, a region that's well-placed to, uh, to have strong economic growth over the medium and, and long term, but not necessarily in the short term. That all, that all de depends. Now, before I get to the uh, Balkans specifically, I want to say, uh, a few words about our transition report. Um, I have a copy here. And by the way, uh, for the first time this year, we uh, have put our, the whole report on the website free of charge. Uh, we, used to, we used to have a very commercial approach to this report and charge for it, whether uh, um, online or, or the hard copies. Now we're, um, we're giving it away, literally. And uh, I hope some of you will... Um, take the time to read what's in the report. If you would like a hard copy, let me know, and I'll try to arrange for you to, to get one. Um, but the, the report this year, the, the title is uh, Recovery and Reform. And I guess it's, uh, it, it's a bit of taking stock. I mean, last year's report was uh, Transition in Crisis with a question mark. Um, and of course, it was at the... the peak or maybe just past the peak of the, the, the crisis, the worst period. Now the dust has settled a little bit and I think it's time to, to take stock a bit and, and see what are the lessons learned, what's the way forward, how can the region, uh, the whole region, the whole region where the EBRD is operating, how can it move forward. And uh, that means uh, re-evaluating the, the growth model. So if I can, um, if I can get this thing to work first. Uh, sorry, but I'll skip. Okay, I'll get the hang of this eventually. Um, <clears throat> so, what was the the growth model in the pre-crisis period? And remember, we did have, uh, you know, for for almost ten years, we were we were coming out of transition reports that were fundamentally um, uh, optimistic and, and 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 highlighting the successes of the of the region, and, and the reason was that the region was growing strongly for, for many years. And that growth model, including the growth model for Southeastern Europe, um, was based on, on these four main elements. So reforms, market-oriented reforms, growing trade integration with, with the whole global economy, um, growing financial integration, particularly with Western, um, Western economies, uh, and political integration, particularly when applied to uh, the new EU members and indeed the, the, the Balkan region, most of which is not yet in the EU but is, is making progress in, in that direction. So that, that model generated uh, high growth, you know, catching up on, on 
richer Western countries, greater prosperity, less poverty. But it also had important weaknesses and, and gaps that are uh, that have really been exposed by the crisis. So I guess uh, it's um, in some ways not that dissimilar from what is going on in this country, although maybe a bit less dramatic in terms of the peaks and, 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 and troughs. Um, now, that raises the question about whether we need a, a new approach after the crisis. And uh, our view is that the, uh, we don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't need to come up with a totally new growth model for this region. I think the, the, the growth that I think will return will still be based on, on integrating more closely with the global economy, on financial flows, trade flows, and investment, and, and the like. But if the region is to return to strong and sustainable growth, it must address the, the weaknesses of the, of the previous model. And, and that is really what the, what the transition report this year so, is about this year. So chapter one is about the reform agenda ahead. And, and in chapter one this year, we, we present a, a new way of thinking about transition, transition gaps, challenges ahead, which is very much sectoral based. So it's looking at 16 different sectors in the economy in, in each of our 29 countries and analyzing where are the reform gaps and, and what needs to be done to, to close these gaps. Uh, chapter three is about um, local currency capital markets. I think one of the weaknesses exposed by the crisis is the, the very high degree of uh, what's known in the uh, academic literature as dollarization, and, and more accurately in this region, it's euroization. So the very strong presence of, of the euro in many of these countries, including I think in all Southeastern European countries, even though none of them uh, with the uh, idiosyncratic exception of Montenegro, uh, none of them has uh, adopted the euro. Montenegro unilaterally has adopted it, but that's a, a separate uh, story. And I think what the region, uh, what the crisis has uh, uh, has exposed is this 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 weakness, uh, this dependence on foreign currency, which is very damaging when you have a downturn, possible depreciation of the currency, leaving unhedged borrowers exposed to currency fluctuations. <coughs> so we are looking and, and proposing various ways to uh, develop local currency financing, local currency capital markets. Uh, chapter four is about exports. And I think one of the messages we try to give in the report, and it's very relevant for the Balkans, is the need to uh, develop exports, strengthen export capacity. And, and why? Because exports uh, and exporting firms are an important source of innovation, they tend to do more research and development, and, and ultimately they are a source of, of growth for the economy. So the, there's an analysis of what are the barriers to uh, exports across countries, and I'll, I'll come back and talk a little bit about that later. And finally, chapter five is, uh, is about the business environment. So I think the crisis, again, I, th I think many countries <clears throat> pushed a lot of these business environment problems under the carpet during the boom years because you know, why worry? We're growing 5 6% a year. Now, when you have a crisis and, and recession, then I think there's a need to look really at what are the obstacles to doing business on a country-by-country -country basis, and, and, uh, and that's what we do in, in, in Chapter 5. Uh, I didn't mention Chapter 2. There are five chapters in the reports, and Chapter 2 is really a macroeconomic chapter, and, and what it shows is that the EBRD region which is the red line at the bottom, was harder hit. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost the, the, some of the years on the x-axis, but it's basically 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011. And the EBRD region was harder hit than other emerging markets. So there was a drop of about 5.5% <laughs> on average in the whole EBRD region in 2009. Uh, this year, there is a bounce back in other emerging markets and indeed in, in, in our region. So we're expecting around about 4%, a little above 4%, uh, again, on a weighted average basis across the whole 29 countries and something very similar in, uh, in 2011. But of course, there's a big dispersion. This figure of 4.2%, 4, 4 I think is our, to be exact, our, our forecast for 
growth for the whole 29 countries on average uh, this year. And, and that, but that, that figure conceals big variation uh, within countries. And that brings me to the Balkans. So the rest of my talk will really be focused on this region. Uh, because if you look at our forecasts, uh, and in fact, we, we issued our forecast a few weeks ago. They are in the report, but we had a separate launch of our forecast. Uh, you'll see that this region is, is lagging behind others. It's lagging behind Central Europe, and it's certainly lagging in terms of growth rates well behind countries further east, the Caucasus, Ukraine, Russia, Central Asia. Uh, now, uh, growth this year overall in, in the Balkans, or southeastern Europe, as we prefer to call it in, in our reports, is, is likely actually to be slightly negative on, on a weighted average uh, basis because we're some of the bigger economies like Croatia and Romania we still see as being in recession and uh, likely to have negative growth this year, Montenegro uh, also. Um, however, the, uh, I think the medium-term outlook is a lot better but it requires addressing these, these challenges, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So let me talk you through a little bit some of the, I'm going to show you some charts uh, just to flesh out these points. So here we have GDP growth in, for each country in 2009, 2010, and 2011. Now, in the limited time available, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I can't go into every country in great detail, but let me pick out some of the highlights, because there are different kind of groups <coughs> of countries. And I suppose I have to start with Albania, which does look uh, as a sort of uh, the shining light in this region, at least in terms of growth rates, because it's the one country that did not have a, uh, a downturn last year. Um, somehow, the Albanian economy throughout the crisis has managed to keep growing at around three, uh, three, three and a half uh, percent. Um, now, it's a little, it's not the easiest economy to understand, uh, and it's a little bit hard to have a good explanation of that, but I think part of it has to do with the fact that Albania is more insulated from global events than other countries in the region. It's less exposed to trade events and, and, and so on. It may be that there's a bit of a delayed effect here, and in fact we do, it's the one country where we forecast a lower growth next year than we do this year. But uh, this is partly just based on anecdotal evidence from our office on the ground who tell us actually a lot of businesses are facing difficulties there. We still see, it, it also affects their exposure to Greece, particularly through trade and also through remittance flows. And, and so we, we penciled in something around 2% for, for next year. But Albania, um, uh, as I say, has, has emerged relatively unscathed from uh, the crisis. Now, uh, Bosnia, Macedonia, uh, and Serbia have quite a similar pattern. So falls last year, Serbia and Bosnia around 3%. Macedonia quite a bit uh, less, some modest growth this year, and, and between 2 and 3% growth maybe uh, in next year. So all three countries, former Yugoslav republics, um, all benefiting to some extent from the, the pickup in global commodity prices, particularly metals, is an important sector in all, in all three countries. In Serbia, also, there's quite a big uh, infrastructure development program, which, which is helping to keep growth uh, uh, propped up. Uh, now, and in fact, two of these countries, Bosnia and Serbia, are benefiting from an IMF program. And Macedonia may be about to, uh, uh, they just had an IMF mission, and they may be about to gain access to what's called a precautionary credit line which would be some sort of flexible IMF, uh, IMF funding. So those, uh, that's those three countries. Now, um, Montenegro also benefiting a bit from uh, global uh, uh, aluminium prices, aluminium being the, the main export for, for Montenegro. But uh, this is a country that had an enormous credit boom in the pre-crisis period, and it's still trying to unwind that that, that uh, is, is trying to basically deal with the after effects of some of these unwise credit decisions. So we, we still expect a slightly negative outcome this year, although this is one country actually where they, they complained a bit about the forecast. They said, well, why, you know, we think it'll be positive this year. 
Uh, so we'll see. It's, it's another country where it's hard to uh, analyze deeply because the quality of the data are quite um, uh, weaker than in other countries. Now, Bulgaria and Romania I've included as well. Uh, so, of course, these are the two EU members in this group. And uh, there is a bit of a difference, I think, between these two countries. Uh, so Bulgaria, we, we're not sure if they're going to grow, if there's going to be positive growth this year, but we have, uh, we did revise our forecast recently from negative to uh, very marginally positive for this year on the basis of uh, very strong export growth, a good uh, agricultural um, performance this year. Uh, and also good tourism season, and that's quite growing importance for uh, Bulgaria. Um, but Romania <coughs> remains in, in quite deep difficulties. I, I just came back from Romania last week, <coughs> and uh, it's clear that the economy is still struggling. Um, we and, and most others predict around minus 2% this year, and it's hard to see a quick return to growth in Romania. We, we expect just under 1% growth next year, but, um, uh, but uh, some analysts actually are more pessimistic uh, than that. And I think the, in Bulgaria, I think the, uh, politically things are a bit more stable and there's a bit more of a degree of confidence that, that they've turned a corner. In Romania, we've not yet reached, uh, we've not yet reached that point. Uh, and that just leaves Croatia, which um, is the most advanced country in this region in terms of uh, the state of its reforms and certainly in terms of GDP per capita. It is significantly richer in that sense than, than the other countries. But the, the macroeconomic performance has really been quite poor in the last couple of years. So growth last year was almost minus 6%. And this year, we expect about minus 1.5 or, or thereabouts. And, and I don't have a good story for why that is, other than it is a, an open economy. It's, on, it's in the final stages of its EU accession uh, prospects. And it is, um, it is quite exposed to developments in the Eurozone and elsewhere. But uh, it, it seems to be really stagnating in an economic sense. Um, we do expect some pickup next year to uh, close to close to two percent. Okay, now I'll just take you through quickly a few uh, a few of the underlying charts. I won't dwell too long on these. So these are industrial production, which uh, you can see a bit of a mixed bag. But uh, the basic message is there's no major turnaround here, with the possible exception of Montenegro. But that's something of a statistical blip. You know, Montenegro, when the biggest company. So it turns around a bit, suddenly you get a big jump in the, in the overall figures. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put too much weight on, on that. Um, credit growth, uh, you, see, you see what it was like in, even in late 2008. It was still on an annual basis growing in most countries at uh, 20 to 30%, um, even 35%. So although there's a bit of a t ticket of, of lines there um, and hard to disentangle, I think the basic ideas downward in both countries uh, until about April mm. of this year and now some gradual sign of, of a pickup. But there's, credit has really tightened up for private sector borrowers. That's one of the reasons why the EBRD has stepped in in a big way to try and meet this, uh, uh, <coughs> meet this gap in the market. Um, but Clearly, for, for growth to return, we're going to need a revival in credit, and, and it's not yet happening in a major way. Uh, exports. Uh, now, this chart, uh, it may be a little bit hard to see, but I, 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 I like this chart because I think it makes a, a, a useful point. I, I'm, comparing, <clears throat> I'm comparing in this chart uh, the Southeastern European countries with the Central Europe and, and Baltic countries. So, the left-hand chart is exports, so year-on-year -year growth, um, and the uh, right-hand chart is imports. So we have 2009 and we have 2010 up to July in most cases. Uh, so uh, the pattern for exports is very similar across countries. Big drop in 2009, significant recovery in 2010. And that's the case whether you're looking at SCE countries or Central European and Baltic countries. But if you look at the right-hand chart, on imports, 
you see big drops in 2009, but you see a difference between the Southeastern European countries and the Central European countries. In Southeastern Europe, imports are not really bouncing back. Romania is a little bit of a blip there, but that's actually to do with some major energy imports, and, and so there's a particular explanation of that. Whereas if you look at countries like uh, Hungary, Poland, um, the Slovak Republic, and so on, there's quite a significant increase in imports as well. And that, I think, is a, is a good indicator of returning confidence and, and returning growth. It's not that imports by themselves are, are good, but when imports are growing, I think it's a sign people uh, are more confident, they're, they're spending more, and, and firms are investing more, because a lot of investment is driven by the investment of, of import goods. Whereas in Southeastern Europe, that level of confidence is still very, very subdued. Now, with regard to investment, uh, we had a big drop in investment in 2009, and again, 2010, with the exception of Albania, and in 2010, the figures, the first half of the year, Compared to the first half of the previous year, you see another drop in most countries, notably in, in Bosnia particularly, also in Bulgaria, in Romania, and in Serbia, uh, and less so in, in some of the other countries. So foreign investors, we, we talk to them all the time at the EBRD. Uh, our role is really to, to be a catalyst for foreign investment. And, and in this region, I think they're, they're quite wary. They're, they're waiting to see what is uh, what is going to what is going to happen? <coughs> and uh, last chart I'll show you is uh, inflation. Again, a, a bit of a, a tangle here. It looks like one of these electricity sort of uh, boxes where you have all these wires crossing. But basically, inflation is, uh, I think, uh, under control in the region. It's 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 quite low. It's a sign, I think, that that overall macroeconomic st stability has been preserved. Uh, Two countries, though, that have traditionally had problems with really controlling inflation are Romania and Serbia, and you can see that those are the two. Uh, those are the two that are up around eight percent. Um, there are good explanations in both countries. In Romania, uh, because of the need to have a big austerity package, they uh, in July this year they increased the VAT rate by five percentage points, so that immediately gave a big jump to inflation. In Serbia, it more reflects, I think, uh, global price pressures, pressure on the exchange rate as well. The, the dinar has depreciated quite significantly this year, and that, of course, is raising import prices and and uh, uh, and raising uh, raising inflation. So that in those two countries, there is a need, I think, for monetary tightening, which will, I think, in the short term, hold back further the uh, the recovery process. Okay, so let me sum up with a few slides and then we'll open up the floor to, to questions. I think in the short term, uh, I think we can look ahead to a better year next year. So our forecasts, to remind you that I, I showed you earlier, are uh, typically in the region of 2 to 3% for most countries. And it's, it, we, we are confident it will be positive growth in, in, in all of them. But there are significant downside risks, and we can't rule out this, this dreaded where the double dip uh, recession. Now, of course, a lot of that depends on how you see things developing in the Eurozone. And of course, that depends on many imponderables, not least how the whole financial crisis and here and possibly elsewhere is, is uh, how that evolves. And this is changing on a day-by-day <coughs> -day basis, uh, I don't need to tell you. But uh, the point is that any downturn in the Eurozone does have important spillover effects to, to this region. This region is no longer isolated from the world. It's very much part of the, the wider European uh, economy. Another factor I haven't mentioned yet is remittances. It's a very important inflow in, in most of these countries. And uh, we've been trying to, it, it can be difficult to get good data on remittances, but from what we've seen, at least based on the official data, there is some evidence of a decline in some countries that may continue as workers abroad lose their jobs or as they, as they come back. I, th I think the country that is perhaps most vulnerable to that is Albania, which really relies heavily on remittances from workers in, in Greece and, and, uh, and Italy. However, mentioning the, uh, Greece, um, I think the, uh, there were a lot of fears that the crisis could spill over to 
neighboring countries in southeastern Europe, but I think so far the the crisis has uh, been contained. I think not least through the assistance of international institutions. And we at the VRD recently have uh, committed to supporting a number of subsidiaries of Greek banks in several of these uh, countries, in Albania, in, in uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and in Serbia. We've put together a package of support uh, for these subsidiaries that amounts to more than 600 million euros. So we're, we're, we're hopeful, and indeed we expect, that the Greek crisis will be uh, will be contained. Now, what about the medium term? Well, here I think uh, it's always important to emphasize, now it's always one of the first things I say when I give talks on the Balkans and, and, and people say, well, what about this problem and that? And, um, and I say, well, look, you know, the, uh, these countries have a lot of potential. <clears throat> they have a lot of catching up to do. Their level of GDP per capita is way below the average in in Western Europe. Uh, and if the right conditions are in place, you would expect these countries to grow faster. You'd expect capital to flow to these countries, which it has done and it will do again if the right conditions are in place. And, and these countries will, I think, grow faster than, than those in, in Western Europe. So, uh, so this idea of catch up and, and, and potential is, is very important. <clears throat> now, the second thing is the, uh, the EU prospects. So uh, two countries that I've, we, we speak about in Southeastern Europe are members, Bulgaria and Romania. Now, both countries have had significant problems in utilizing EU funds. It's a big issue in both countries. It's a big political issue. Politicians are under pressure to explain to people why all these EU funds are available, why are they not being used. And fundamentally, it boils down to a, I think, capacity problem. It's, it's complex to put together projects. It's a very complex problem, very complex dealing with Brussels and, and getting the right documentation placed and the right rules to do with procurement and, and, and the like. And these two countries are struggling. And, and a lot of people are trying to think of ways in which to speed up the disbursement of, of funds for projects. Because these projects, a lot of them are infrastructure or environmental and, and so on, and they really are, are needed. The point is that they, uh, I think the utilization rate will improve. For candidate countries or potential countries, there are uh, also substantial EU funds available, particularly once you become a candidate. And uh, uh, you know, once these funds are used, I think it really does build up medium long-term growth uh, capacity in terms of better uh, institutions and, and better, better quality infrastructure. Uh, and I think it's, it's that perspective of ultimate EU membership <coughs> which is attractive to investors. And there is still, although the EU ha has many problems of its own, as you, as you know very well in, in this and have analyzed at length in this uh, institute, uh, there is, I think, still momentum towards uh, EU membership in, in all countries. Uh, most recently, you will have seen that the, uh, the Commission has recommended that Montenegro become a candidate country. The European Council has asked the Commission to prepare an opinion on Serbia's application for a candidacy. And then, of course, Croatia, which is leading the field among the candidates, is, I think, uh, quite close now to completing negotiations on the Aki and is still, I hope and expect, on, on track for membership in, in, uh, in 2012. Uh, okay, so those are the medium term prospects. What is the reform agenda? So let me go back to some of the points I made at the start of the talk. And here I'm going back to some of the messages from uh, our reports. So I think uh, there is still a big reform agenda. The, the, a lot of progress has been done in transition, but there is still very significant what we call transition gaps. And if you look on a sector by sector basis, which is what we do in this report, you see that the biggest gaps tend to be in infrastructure, things like roads, railways, energy, uh, sustainable energy, very important, increasingly important issue for this region. 
and then in various aspects of financial institutions. Not so much the banking sector, but rather things like development of capital markets, pension funds, private equity markets, and, and so on. The, here, these countries still lag well behind Western uh, comparators, and, and it's, uh, it's a big agenda ahead for the next five to, five to ten years. Uh, local currency markets I've spoken about already, and I want to emphasize again, this is something we at the EBRD, with our colleagues at the uh, IMF and the World Bank, uh, are very focused on now. We are really working actively with a number of countries in Southeastern Europe and elsewhere to try and develop local currency uh, capital markets. And in fact, we have committed by next May to come up with a detailed report and, and list of recommendations that will help develop local currency markets. And why? Because it will unlock capital that's otherwise not available, and it will help make the future growth model a bit safer in the, term, in, in the sense of it's insulating borrowers and lenders to some extent from, from currency swings. Uh, exports, how can we increase export potential? Uh, here, I think the uh, it's not so much about reducing tariffs, because tariffs, I think, facing exporters in these countries are already quite low, and there is this regional free trade agreement, which uh, has very much helped that process and, and uh, is really operational now and is helping to facilitate, facilitate trade among all of, these all of these Western Balkan countries in particular. Uh, but there are still important non-tariff barriers and I think corruption on the borders is also still a significant problem. Um, so if those can, problems can be addressed, then that can help give a very significant boost to uh, exports. And finally, it's, uh, it boils down also to improving the business environment. Now, where do these countries stand on the business environment? Well, um, there are many cross-country surveys, and we have been involved in some of them. And, and in the report, we, we look at some of the managers' responses to surveys through the what we call the BEEPS, Business Environment and Enterprise Performance Survey, which is a big uh, joint survey we carry out every few years with the World Bank. Uh, but just to give you a little flavor, uh, I want to show you uh, another survey. Now, this is the World Bank's doing business survey. So this came out after our report actually went to press. It came out about a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, and it's an overall measure of <coughs> ease of doing business. Again, it's, it's, World, it's World Bank, so it's not EB or D. But uh, I think the results are broadly in line with our thinking in the sense that um, Southeastern Europe countries are a bit spread out in terms of their rankings. So maybe surprisingly, Macedonia is the best ranked country. It's ranked, I think, uh, somewhere around 35th in the world in terms of ease of doing business followed by Bulgaria and Romania, uh, and then Montenegro, and then you have Albania, Croatia, and Serbia grouped uh, quite closely together in the sort of between 80, 80 and 90 in, in the world. And, and worst of all is Bosnia and Herzegovina, which I think is around 110th or something. So this doing business index is, is very much based on laws on the books. And as such, it doesn't capture the, sometimes the reality, the difficulties that businesses on the ground face. And, and what we find from our business environment surveys is that these obstacles can be quite significant. In some countries, it's to do with tax administration as a major problem. In other countries, it's about political instability. In, in other countries, it's about reducing uh, corruption. Uh, so there's a different, it, there isn't a one solution fits all in terms of business environment. It's, it's, our surveys suggest that the problems vary across countries, but I think by analyzing what businesses say, you can then make a start towards diagnosing the problem and then finding a solution for it. And I think that, that I think is something where all countries in the region have still got quite a long way to go. So I've more or less finished. I rather cheekily put uh, two recommendations for reading, and you won't be surprised to see that one of them is the, uh, the new transition report, and the other one, rather shamelessly, I'm putting up my <laughs> slide of my book with Chris Feech, which uh, I don't know if it's actually on sale in any of the shops here in Dublin, but it's certainly on Amazon and other websites, and 
uh, with Christmas coming up, I do hope some of you will feel the urge to buy it. So I'll stop there and turn it.